like I said, I know that you control, and that is exactly what I need to hear this morning. Amen. And so I'm just thankful, and I know that God is good all the time, you know, and uh, He will never leave us or forsake us. And I've been praying about some things in the last few weeks, and things are falling into place Amen. because I've been claiming victory, mm -hmm. and I just know that things are going to continue to get better, and I thank God for that. So, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lord. Uh, now that I do have a testimony and also a prayer request. Uh, some of you know my history. I don't go into it a lot, but uh, it was pretty sordid as I was a young man. Uh, a young man, I had some failed marriages and other issues. But uh, I have a daughter uh, who lives in New Jersey. She's coming back this coming week. And a son who lives in uh, down the lake of the Ozarks. And he's, he's coming back. These are two that I have contact with, but, but not on a regular basis, person to person. I mean, we talk on the phone and I, I visit my son occasionally. But uh, because we've been kind of estranged from when they were kids, uh, you know, it's a little bit more of a challenge. But uh, we do have a relationship and we've had an ongoing uh, conversation. And they're all going to be back here at the same time next week. Mm. So it's going to be really good, but really awkward, too, I'm sure.
continue to pray for, for my wife that the truth, the Lord's trying to reveal to her and to reveal through the Holy Spirit. And our, <clears throat> also for my nephew. Uh, he's 15 years old. He's been made the drummer of the worship ministry of the church school. And uh, I asked him, I sent him a message the other day and I said, hey, I want you to pray for me specifically for the situation for today. And one thing that I was telling my mom was that you cannot tell him, make sure that you say your prayers overnight. That's going to be revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. But I think what's going to help him grow spiritually and actually go after the Lord and pursue him is the fact that people are coming to him because they see him as a figure of authority on this earth because the Lord is in him. So I, I think that's going to help him out so that he continues to have that revelation and goes after it because I think he's going to do great things when he gets out of that school and, and graduates and because I know he's going to be part of the worship ministry of another church. We all have decisions that we have to make, and the enemy is really quick to have a second guess. You know, we think this is the right thing to do, and we think the door opens, and then we think, oh, what was that? Was that was that me? Was it? we? Jay and I have had situations that we we made a decision. We've we've done. It. We asked the Lord if this is your will. You know, if this is the thing to do.
something came alive in me. He said, something hit me. He said, I don't know what it was, but you know, he said, uh, he said, something just came alive in me. I don't know what it was, but something came alive in me. I said, that that was God. He yeah. said, it had nothing to do with me. That's just God. He goes, yeah, but when, he goes, people prayed for him, but when you prayed, he goes, it was like life. Stand at your feet. We're gonna we're gonna believe that she's gonna come up out of this bed mm -hmm. and walk away. Mm -hmm. That's and uh, my dad said that when Nathan was praying, he had his eyes closed. He he said I could have swore that when I opened my eyes, she would have been she would have been sitting up mm -hmm. in the bed. He goes, it's just something that I felt in me that I thought that she was gonna walk home with me while Nathan was praying. Mm -hmm. I said, Dad, that that wasn't even Nathan. I said that is God. That is God telling you I am life. Yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not this death that you're seeing. But I was still wrestling in my mind, like, you know, Lord, I stood in rehab. You know, I I believed in uh, and I and I know I was I started thinking I'm making this me. You know, I'm not making it God. I know that God's gonna turn it out for the good. So anyway, my dad said that he goes, I was out walking the bike trail thinking about God. And he really <coughs> really mad. He goes, uh, he said, I started like saying this, is, you know, going back to saying this isn't true and, and everything. He goes, but I, he walked for about an hour. He goes, and all of a sudden, for the last 45 minutes, I noticed that I was praying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Praying to God. Amen. And he goes, I'm not going to start any church. I'm not going to start going to church. I'm not going to. He goes, he goes, but I think I'm ready to give my life to him. Thank the Lord. saying that God took her because uh, you know God's not a God of death but I was just thinking to myself it may have been me, it may have been God, I don't know but God may have said if you come now, your husband will be saved wow. and she said take me Amen. you know Amen. so uh, I just I just think that my dad's going to be saved through it all and yes, God. God. Yes, God turning it around for good yeah. so, me of how much Jesus loves us, that he takes care of a little sparrow, there's a little bird out there fluttering its little wings, <laughs> it's amazing, you know, it's kind of, just a reminder of how much he cares for us, to yeah. me, but uh, I got to see Abby, and what a blessing, she's like, oh yeah, the puppet lady, <laughs> so I was so glad I got to see her, though she didn't live, I have a testimony of another person who did, a uh, lady that I worked with, uh, that worked with me for about four or five years, had called me a couple Wednesdays ago, and she all, lives all the way past Dallas Center in Menlo or something way, way out there. Her husband decided he was going to come to town with her that day to go to Methodist <laughs> Hospital to visit some friends. And they got to Methodist, and he's like, honey, I just don't feel well. Let's just drive around for a little bit and, and maybe get something to eat. And, and why don't you, you, you drive from here? She got... They thought they'd go to Perkins. They got up as far as 10th Avenue, and he was DOA. <laughs> he died in the car on her. Thank God she was close to Methodist. Uh, she was really close to Lutheran Hospital, so she got him over there. They was able to resuscitate him, took him back over to Methodist Hospital. I went and spent about three hours with her on Wednesday night two weeks ago, and uh, she got to take him home. And, uh, I mean, it's just a miracle. When I went in there, she said, Sheila, come in and pray with me and, 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 you know, just believe with me that he's going to live and he's not going to die. Uh, they winded up getting a blood clot. They winded up cutting an artery on one leg that affected another leg. Anyway, I got a text from her this morning that he's back in the hospital again. But he's alive, and his work's obviously not done. So, you know, we can say death or we can say life, and we spoke life, and he did live. So we don't always understand the circumstances, Jason, why one does, one doesn't, but, you know, she
she was able to talk to you guys, communicate with you guys, and we know God did a great turnaround in Eddie's life, too, so Amen. she could at least Amen. give you guys that hope. But pray for Paul and pray for Cheryl this morning. They're back at the hospital. What's going on? Um, also, Mary Kate, that God goes with diverticulitis. I went and prayed with her. She asked me to come over this week. She's having just a lot of hip pain. Her son had surgery on Friday. His name is Rick. She says, I just believe in you guys' prayer. She will just pray. I know that you guys believe in miracles. My aunt um, is doing very well. They're going to start radiation. They said if they didn't start radiation that she would literally strangle to death because this tumor is so, so large and it's in her neck. But uh, we're just praying that the Lord will help you know, the radiation, the chemo, to work with her body. I mean, that's what I told them. We're praying that this will work with your body, not against your body. There's not going to be any side effects, and just God's will to be done, because that would be a horrible way to death, die, just to strangle, you know, aspirate or whatever to death. And I, we're trusting the Lord's going to be faithful in that. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, with these needs, let's just stand and declare things to the Lord. Just love on Him. Lord, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the words of God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the things that you have done in your life. We thank you, Lord, that you deal with all these situations, Lord. Let the sounds of prayer come from this place, O Lord. In your name, I feel the high. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be magnified. I pray, Lord Jesus, I pray for Jesus. I pray for Emmy's family, Lord Jesus, that you give us character, that you give us peace, Lord, that you watch over us, Lord Jesus, that you touch it, Lord Jesus, that you touch it, Lord Jesus, that the things of this life, Lord, be your hope, you want to do it, Lord, 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 you want to do
make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. You make one cherub on, on one end and a cherub on the other end. And you shall make the cherub at the two ends of it and one place at the mercy seat. <coughs> and the cherubim shall stretch out the wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And they shall face one another, and the face of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. Then we move on to what Pastor was talking about. And I know this is specifically straight for what the scripture is talking about in John 20, 12. And she saw, as Mary was coming into the tomb, two angels and in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus is slain. <coughs> when she came in, naturally Jesus was gone. <coughs> but this was before she came in. The presence of the angels on the left and on the right, like you saw Aaron and her, like you saw the cherubim on the Ark of Presence. God was in the center. As you saw at the beginning, <coughs> Moses was a type of and shadow of Christ to come. Okay? <coughs> so this is where we're seeing it now. Now it brings it up to today. <coughs> your left hand, your right hand. Psalms 134 2. <coughs> Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. 1 Timothy 2 8. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. <coughs> I'm going to challenge you this day. <coughs> As you saw, Moses was in the center. As you saw, the presence of the Lord was in the midst of <coughs> the cherubim. As you saw, as Mary came in, there was two on the left and on the right. The presence of the Lord was in the center that, at that specific time. <coughs> Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yeah. He's in you. Let the left hand and the right hand just be like the cherubim, just like the Aaron's and the hers, and just like the situation with the two angels. Let the glory of the Lord come forth within you now as Rebecca leads us in worship and that name would be glorified in Mary. Praise God. Amen. Amen.
the knowledge of the Lord. Come, come, come to the King of all creation. Throw down your idols, take up your cross.
Time 
This isn't a rebuke in any way. We all struggle with these things, every one of us. I've prayed for people and seen them healed. I've, I've prayed for people that had been pronounced dead and they were raised. I know the joy and the elation of seeing God move in a person's life. I also know the disappointment and the pain when seemingly God doesn't do what we think he should be doing in that situation based on his word. But the truth is, experience does not dictate who we are or what we do. We do what the word of God says in spite of the outcome, in spite of what the, the results may be in the natural. Because we don't know, but the next person you pray for could be the one that gets raised from the dead. The next one could be the one that the cancer is eradicated. We know God can do this. We know that this is what God does. Our job is to simply be faithful in spite of. When the Bible talks about the heroes of faith, man, I'm telling you, you read a little history about these people, and they were screw-ups. These were people that had all kinds of issues, dysfunction, and everything else, and yet God calls them the heroes of faith. He doesn't, he doesn't record their doubts. He records their belief. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, we serve, I can tell you from experience, we serve a God who does not measure us by our behavior. The moment you accept him, you are a new creature in Christ. And have every bit of the assets and power and anointing of the Holy Ghost of heaven at your disposal. I'm not saying there aren't consequences for our behavior. Because God knows I lived a, an immoral life. Not because I was raised that way. I made choices. My parents were good, decent, God-fearing people. But I made decisions. And those decisions go on results of those decisions. But thank God, we have a God who restores all things. Even our biggest screw-ups, He can still make it work together for good. Even all my failures, God has still blessed me with children that love me, that want to be a part of the, my family, my heritage. And that's only because of the goodness of God. That's only because God has been favorable to me. I'm not the wealthiest guy in the world by any means. But I tell you what, I, I, I have something that I can give to my children. That's faith. That's just simply believing God. They all acknowledge that. They all recognize it in spite of the past. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dichotomy. I mean, it's a contradiction that one life can be so different it's true for every one of us. Don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on your children, your grandchildren, your brothers, your sisters, your parents. It's never too late. It's never over. Praise the Lord. All things do work together for good. Just because we can't quite comprehend that. Believe me, I've still got questions about some things that I've prayed about and haven't seen them. But, but there is a purpose that we don't always understand and can't always see. But we will know. We know right now, God is a good God. And he's good all the time. He's not wavering in the way that he responds to us. He responds to us as though each one of us were Jesus. Perfect. Accepted. Beloved. That's our Father. He is the only perfect Father, believe me. We all had our earthly fathers, and we love them in spite of their faults. And God knows <laughs> if your father was anything like mine, he had his faults, praise the Lord. But he was still a good man. He still thanked the Lord before he passed away. He became a believer. Hallelujah, Hallelujah and I'll see him again. We sometimes miss it when we when we try to shrink everything down to this 80 years, 90 years, if you're lucky. And this is just a hiccup in what God has created and in what we're going to experience. So everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. May be seated in Jesus' name. God bless all of you for being here.
kids can be dismissed to go downstairs. Hope everybody will stay and enjoy the soup and the salads and whatever else might be down there. I know Sally made uh, really good gumbo. I spilled it on me already this morning. <laughs> Loaded it up in the car. Thanks, Mike, for the opening and sharing your uh, thoughts with us this morning, what God has given you. Thanks to the worship team. Praise the Lord. It'd be uh, easy for me to be uh, a little morose or depressed or what have you. This hasn't been the greatest week. Uh, my mother's been in the hospital. She's normally in a nursing home. She, her, her health has deteriorated. She's 92 years old. You would expect that it, uh, it might. But uh, she's been in the hospital for the last five days, I guess, with uh, pneumonia. And the last time I was there uh, visiting with her, because I've got a, another sister uh, here locally and uh, brother and sister-in-law that we kind of try to rotate around so that everybody spends time with her, but uh, so that no one person has to be there every single day. And we all have other things that we have to be involved with as well. But when I was with her the last time, I was with her uh, three times this week, and the last time was she was... Uh, she was feeling better, and she was actually communicating more than, than she does a lot of times. And she actually knew who I was, which is always nice. I always, uh, whenever she's upset with me, I always tell my older brother David that uh, she thought I was you today. <laughs> mean as mean as she could be, she must have thought I was you. Uh, so anyway, but uh, I was talking to her, and I and I know she's depressed as anybody would be. If he's, you know, when you're conscious and where and you see how you're physically and mentally has deteriorated to such a degree. And my mother was always a self-promoting, self-motivating kind of person, hardworking. After my dad died, she worked for years selling furniture. And then even after she retired, she kept working at Adventureland in the wardrobe department just because she wanted to be busy and doing something and feeling like she was, she didn't have to, she, she wasn't like she was going to starve to death. Always, you know, just took care of herself, didn't need, you know, a lot of outside help or anything or even wanted. So it's difficult, you know, for her to now not be able to do anything for herself and have to have somebody else do everything, feed her, change her clothes and, you know, give her a bath and all this stuff. So, and I know how humiliating that is because I can only imagine what it would be like if it was me. I'm the kind that don't want a lot of people doing stuff for me either, you know. I appreciate it, but I want to be able to take care of myself. So I know how she must feel. And so it was heartbreaking uh, when she was saying some of those things to me. And, and I just reminded her, I said, you know, Mom, Jesus loves you more than you can ever imagine. Because she's obviously feeling like, I'm ready to go. Just let's be done with this and move on. And I said, uh, He's with you right now. He'll always be with you. He'll never leave you. You're going to, one day, when that day comes, and you close your eyes, when you open them, you'll be right in the presence of the Lord. And you'll realize at that moment, you have been in the presence of the Lord from the moment you became a believer. I had the privilege of seeing my mother, who was a believer in Christ all of her life, raised up in a Methodist church, never smoked, never drank, Taught, tried to teach us kids to be good citizens, believers in God, sent us to Sunday school, to church, and so on and so forth. And uh, actually, she was pretty successful, although there was a while in there some would have questioned that, <laughs> including myself. But uh, I was preaching for Brother Butcher one time, not long after we'd come back here from Texas. And uh, my mother, who was always kind of, i got to say proud, I guess, maybe, because she was a believer, and I'm sure she had some questions about my faith. Hmm. But I was preaching, and she came up to the front, which is something I would have never imagined her to do. Because she wasn't the kind of person to draw attention to herself. With tears. 
rolling down her cheeks. This has been 25 years ago, maybe 30 years ago now. And uh, I said, I want that Holy Spirit. What are you talking about? And I said, well, Mom, you didn't have to come up here. You could have stated it. No, she said, I want everybody to know that I'm serious. And God filled her with the Holy Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues. greatest moments in my life. Not because she wasn't saved, but because she believed that God had something more. Amen. Amen. And that he'd be willing to give it to her, she asked. Amen. So when I was talking to her, I, I was trying to get her to understand because she never had a lot of teaching. <coughs> you got to understand, 30 years ago, I was preaching Hell is hot, and you're probably going there. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I got just as loud and screamed just as much and jumped up and down. And I saw little Jimmy in the red shirt headed straight for hell at the end of the service if he didn't come forward. And I mean, I know the whole thing. I did all this. So... She never really understood a lot of the, the goodness, the grace of God. Not that I wasn't trying to let people understand the love of God. It, just the way I was taught, the way I understood because of the theology that I had been taught, because of the denomination I was with, that the, it was way more about us than it was about God. There was a lot more onus on what we did and how we did it than there was on God's grace and what God did for us. Thank God his grace is there even for stupid people, even for sincerely people, sincere people that are just sincerely ignorant. But I want to talk to you about some things that, that the Lord started bringing up to me as I was talking to my mother, thinking about uh, Abby. I talked to got a call from the funeral director uh, asking me if I was going to be available to just be a part of the service. I mean, I don't know really what he had in mind. And, and I told him, you know, geez, I'm honored by this. and uh, I really appreciate the family, you know, wanting to include me. But I've got a daughter coming back from Jersey that I haven't seen for 10 years. I mean, I talked to her, but I haven't seen her. Uh, son that I haven't seen since he moved to the, to the lake area. He was living in St. Louis with his family. So it's been a couple of years since I've seen him. And uh, they haven't been together. They had different mothers. Uh, I, don't like, I don't talk about this a whole lot because I don't want to embarrass Sally. Uh, but, you know, I had these relationships years ago. I've been married to Sally for 35 years. They're the reality. And mm -hmm. These kids are now 40 years old. Yep. I mean, my oldest son will be 50 next year. And uh, the youngest is Allison, our Sally and I's daughter, and she'll, she's 33. And in between there, there's three others. Mm -hmm. Tony and Steph, and then Aaron, Georgia, and Allison. And so uh, I owe it to them to give them an opportunity to you know, rebond and, you know, get to know each other as adults and their families and so on and so forth, because I'm not going to be here forever, and I'd like to see them have their relationships restored. Amen. And God promises those things. That's right. So anyway, that's why I told the funeral director, then I called Blake and, and said, you know, geez, I feel horrible about this. I hope, you know, I'm not the one that everybody's counting on to, to hold the service, not to be presumptuous, but I mean, the guy called me and I'm honored by it, by the offer, but the, the situation of my family right now, I got to deal with it, you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to be disrespectful or, or hurt anybody's feelings or offend anybody, but at the same time, I got this long-term commitment here, I got to deal with it as well, so, and it was very understanding, and I don't know how all that turned out, because I never heard anything back, so hopefully he's understanding, he said it was, but I'm just saying that 
life is complicated. And uh, we can put so much focus on the here and the now. And God promises us many, many promises for the here and now. But there's something greater than this, too. And so I want to talk about kind of both of those things this morning, if I could ever get past my opening here. <laughs> my mind is going in about a million different directions. So, But let's, let's get right into this. Acts chapter 1. And I want to read just uh, verses 9 through 11. spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven so talking to my mother and thinking about all of these life kind of situations caused me to kind of think more about this. Maybe maybe it wasn't necessarily me thinking about it so much as it was God trying to speak to me about some of these things. But what I realized is that we, we really don't know what the disciples were thinking when this happens. When they're, they're staring at the sky, kind of like a deer caught in the headlights, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. And the two angels here had to kind of snap them out of this daze that they were in and, and bring them around, try to kind of get their attention. In verse 11, he says, which also said, that's these angels, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? What are you looking at, you know? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So, obviously, the apostles were trying to figure out the meaning of the ascension. And they had been, they were trying to figure it out from the moment that it happened. They're trying, they're going like, what is, what is this all about? You know, what's, what's happening here? And the, the ascension is also puzzling to us. And for us, the question isn't so much what happened. The question is why it happened. It's not just Jesus returning to heaven from earth. There's more to it than that. It's, it's a new enthronement. For Jesus and a new relationship with us. It's not just a change in altitude. It's not like here he was and now he's up there somewhere. Jesus isn't just higher than everybody else. But he has new power and he has new authority and a change actually even in legal status and in relationship. Jesus could have just disappeared. He could have just vanished. He didn't have to go up into the clouds because, I mean, he'd already done this before. He had disappeared before on the road to Emmaus. He's talking to these guys. They finally figure out who he is, and pop, he's gone. You know, he's just not there anymore. So there was a reason for this particular way of doing it. There's more to it than him being here and then just going up like he's on an elevator, amen, without the cage. But instead, he rises up into the clouds and disappears in the distance of the heavens. Now, sometimes we forget that the heavens are not heaven. Right. The heavens, we got satellites, we got all kind of, well, I remember the Russians saying, we've been there and we didn't see God. There is no God. He wasn't there. That, how stupid can you be? <laughs> that just shows their ignorance. Heavens are heavens, but heaven is heaven. It's not just a place in geography somewhere, even out in space. It's another dimension. Right. Praise the Lord. And it's something that we are not going to figure out how to get there because there's only one way to get there. That's right, man. Thank you, Jesus. So the symbolism of the elevation is of authority and power and relationship. That's what this symbolic act is a metaphor for. It's more than just Jesus going up. It's showing us that he's got greater power. He's got uh, greater uh, authority. And the relationship that he has now has advanced as well. It's, it's increased the same. 
Jesus was, what he was doing there was actually tracing out physically what was happening cosmically and spiritually. He's showing them physically because remember, these guys didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have much discernment. We know they didn't. They were, they're standing at, the, at the, the grave I talked about here a week or two ago, and they're crying because he's dead and somebody took the body. Where he had been teaching them for three and a half years that he was going to die, be crucified, be buried, and raised on the third day. Right. So it wasn't like they, these are really sharp individuals when it comes to discernment. They didn't get it. So he was, he was going, think about this, he was going right then, right now, as the unique God-man. Fully human. Fully God. And he was going to take his place at the throne as the new king and the new head of the human race. Yeah. You ought to say hallelujah right there because there's something really big in what he was doing. He's now the king, yeah. amen, and the head of this new human race, of every born again new creation, which is the new human race that we're talking about here. Yeah. Really, I mean, this is where Christian theology can push your, your thinking, amen, out to the very edge of what you can even imagine. When he became flesh, he became fully human. Yes. Besides being vulnerable, uh, able to be injured, able to be killed, able to be hurt, able to be emotionally touched and, and affected, he, he had limitations. He had limitations of being in one place at one time. He had a time-space limitation. Amen? Uh -huh. Even after his resurrection, though, he could be touched. He was still human. He could still eat normally and drink. Luke, let's look at Luke chapter 24, verse 39. <clears throat> Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Mm -hmm. This is after the resurrection. He's still a human. He's letting them know this. I'm still a human being. He still has a human nature, and yet he's also changed. Look at John chapter 20 and verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. The doors are shut, he just shows up. He didn't open the doors. He didn't knock and say, It's Jesus, can I come in? Or Sam sent me. He just is there. He's just right in the middle of it. His human nature is still human, but he's undergone a transformation. What we have in all of this is a picture of our own future. You think about it. And the older you are, the more you'll think about it. But don't just put this chronological thing, you know, in charge. Because none of us have tomorrow promised. Right. We have God promised. But we all know you can step out of here today and get hit by a truck or more likely a dart us here in Des Moines, but uh, you know what I'm saying, stuff happens, <laughs> praise the Lord, but this is a picture of us, it's a picture of our future, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. So believers are eventually going to be resurrected just like Jesus. Yeah. Right. And we'll have human bodies. But they'll be restored and enhanced to what we were before sin ever entered the earth. Come on. Amen. We won't be subject to decay or death. And we'll have new powers and senses that we can't even imagine right now. Mm -hmm. 
But at the ascension, there's another change that's taken place as well. As long as the man Jesus existed in the world of space and time, he could only be at one spot or one place at any given time. If you wanted to hear him, if you wanted to relate to him in any way, if you wanted to experience him, you had to be at that place at that time. But at the ascension, Jesus leaves the space-time continuum <laughs> and passes into the reality of God. Who he always was, but he was operating as man. He's still human. He's still our second Adam. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Because he's the second Adam, he's going to reverse what the first Adam did. But now everything he does has a cosmic scope. Amen? Do you understand what I'm saying? Before, what he had was limited. It was in that space, at that time, that's all it could affect. Yep. But now, because of the ascension, what the ascension represents is he can do the same thing, only he can do it on a cosmic level. He can do it anywhere, everywhere, at the same time. He can, how many of you know he can speak to Mike and speak to me about two totally different things at the same point? And we can be 100 miles away from each other. That's right. Amen. Amen. And beyond that, he can be doing it to every other person in this room and every other believer on the planet Amen. at the same time. Amen. We're talking about increased power, increased authority, a completely different dimension, a completely different way of this same person operating in terms of the level, in terms of the, of the masses of people and, and territory, if you will, that he can cover. Look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, thou hast said, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Praise the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 2. Verses 33 through 36. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. Praise the Lord. So Jesus has always been king. I mean, he has always had authority over us because he's God. Amen. But now, at the ascension, as the risen God-man, he begins his job as head of the church now. Not just creator of the universe, but head of a specific human race. A new creation. And he rules over all other powers, all other rulers... Heavenly or earthly. Amen. And everything he does, he does for the church. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. 120, uh, yeah, chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in, heavenly, in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Praise the Lord. Now, uh, he does it, all of this that we just read, and I don't know, I guess you could say more, whatever else there is if there is anything else, but he does it all by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. John chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. I'm using a lot of scripture here because I want you to see I'm not just talking about trying to put 
something here together. Hopefully I can. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, this is Jesus speaking, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. A little while he shall see, not see me, and again a little while and he shall see me, because I go to the Father. Which means, Jesus is ruling over and controlling all of history toward its final goal, in which the church, so the new people of God, are finally and fully liberated. The Holy Spirit is the seal. The promise that if I go away, I'm coming back. Right. And I'm coming back for a whole new world. Yeah. A whole new species of people and a whole new world and a whole new heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 18. <clears throat> for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So I'm saying, I don't know what you're going through or have gone through or may go through. But I can tell you this, whatever it is, it's nothing compared to what God's going to do through you. Nothing. We, we focus so much on everything working out exactly the way we want it to. But I'm telling you, there's a greater glory. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm not saying we should ever back off from what the Scripture says we are to do. But I'm saying we do it with an understanding that it's not about us. The Holy Spirit is doing something. What the Holy Spirit is doing is pointing back to God, pointing back to Jesus, revealing Him, the revelation of Him. Amen? Simply here that Jesus is directing a cosmic transaction, if you will. A plan, a cosmic transition, mm -hmm. and it's a plan. It's a, it, it has a it has a divine direction, a beginning and, a, and an ending in the sense that it happens even in in our time and in our sphere of of uh, reality here. Right. And it's one that's going to bring a new heaven and a new earth, and it's happening now, and it's happening in us. It happens in us first. All of the power of God is resident in me right this minute. Yeah. Amen. You say, how can you say that? Well, because Jesus is God. He's seated now, not at the right hand of God. I used to say this all the time just because I could. But if, if God takes up all space, if God is everywhere, he's a spirit. And if Jesus is sitting at his right hand, how long is God's arm? How big is his hand? We're, mi we're, we're, we're missing the point here. He's not seated next to another individual. He has now been seated in the position of God's all-powerful position. Amen. Amen. This man. Woo! You ought to get excited about this because we're talking about a man now right. hey, who is seated in the position of God with all power. That same man, that same spirit that's behind that is in me right now. And the Bible even says, I'm seated with him in heavenly places. How crowded could that lap get with everybody? You understand what I'm saying? He's giving us a symbolic, a metaphor here for we have been put in the same position of all power. That's not blasphemy. That's understanding something about what this ascension is all about. It's more than just me flying off to heaven one day, which is a great thing, and thank God for it. But right now, Christ has come back. He has, a, has descended in us. Amen. And he wants his glory to be revealed. And only when we get a, an understanding of this is that reality going to take place. I know there's a literal return of the Lord. But there's also a literal return of the Lord by the Spirit that we now have. Just as there has already been an ascension of us, a rapture, if you will, and are seated with Him in heavenly places. 
There's going to be a physical, but there's already been the spiritual of this. There always has to be. It has to come there first. Any miracle that's going to take place takes place in us before it ever takes place as a result of something that we're doing. And we forget that sometimes there's a disconnect. There's a short. Amen? We used to say in the Marine Corps, get your head and butt wired together. You know, so you can actually do what it is you're supposed to be training to do or trained to do. Well, we could say the same thing. We could say, get your intellect and your spirit wired together here because sometimes there's a disconnect and even though we know things, we don't do them because we let other parts of us, our natural man, get in the way of it. Or circumstances dictate to us rather than the spirit dictate. Now this, I know I'm, I'm kind of off in a wild goose chase here, but this is all part of the ascension. It's part of what the disciples were, and apostles were trying to figure out that day. What is this? What's this all about? When they receive the Holy Spirit, it starts to open up to them. It starts to, the problem is we, we have spent so much time preaching about sin, so much time preaching about failure. God knows there's plenty of that, and we all experience it. But we haven't really talked about our new identity, our new creation. We talk about Jesus. We talk about grace. That's all wonderful. But the main reason for talking about grace is to release us or to free us into the new identity that we actually have. So we're not held in bondage to the law, to the flesh, to our weaknesses, to our humanity. Praise the Lord. Look at, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Jesus had this capacity to live in that reality. Now, remember, this was still just a man. He was God, but he didn't operate as God. He operated strictly as a man. We have to understand. We have to learn that this is our function. This is the way we're supposed to operate. The devil's idea is to get us to focus on something that didn't happen. I went through this. I'll tell you, I, I, I had a real problem with God for a while when my sister passed away. I'd prayed with her, and I know her theology wasn't exactly the same as mine. I'd given her lots of tapes. I'd talked to her about, but, you know, that aside, God's still the same, whether, you know, our theology is all in sync or not. Right. And I was mad. I was mad at God. I was mad at myself. I was trying to figure out who can I blame here. Same way with my brother. I spent 24 hours praying every 15 minutes. They wouldn't let you stay in the room every 15 minutes. I'd get up, I'd go in, I'd pray, I'd confess, I'd go back, wait 15 minutes, go back. At the end of the 24 hours, he was dead. They unplugged him, and that was it. And I felt the same kind of disappointment, the same kind of anger, the same kind of, what, 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 what else am I supposed to do? You know, I mean, is there something hidden here that I'm just too stupid to see? I, am I... Am I so carnal? Am I so ungodly? What what is happening that this isn't taking place? And then one day, just out of the clear blue, the Lord said, who are you going to believe? Your eyes or my word? I said, well, but but wait a minute. They're they're buried. You know, he said, they're alive. They're not dead. I'm not trying to to squeeze out a victory where it looks like there's a defeat here. I'm just saying, this is the way God looks at this. It doesn't take faith to see God do everything I ask Him to do. Amen? It takes faith to believe God when I don't see God doing what I think He's supposed to be doing. God is honored by that. God is glorified by that. And it really isn't about, because I'll tell you, you go and pray for people where there's unbelief. And they'll mock you. Right. Can you say praise the Lord back there? Uh, uh, I mean, I know. It. I've been there. I've, I've had it happen plenty of times. You've got to get to the place where you're thick-skinned enough where you just say, you know, 
pardon this, but to hell with them. We're dealing with a heaven issue here about somebody's eternal you know, life. Not just the person that's being healed or delivered, but in the case of Jason's dad, there's another whole other dynamic going on there that we don't even know about. Yes. And I promise you this, knowing Evie, where she is today, she wouldn't change one more breath on this stinking planet for what she already has. Not to mention the fact that if it in any way initiated or instigated a softening, softening of the heart of John, She'd say it was worth it. That little bit of suffering, nothing compared to what I'm experiencing and what he will experience. Yes, yes. Again, I'm not copping out here. I'm not trying to make a, an excuse. Because we still got to do everything this Bible tells us to do. We just don't always know exactly what this cosmic plan is that has been in effect before the foundation of the world. We've got a number on us somehow, some way, and that, that number has got to hit certain points on a graph somewhere in heaven, if you will. I'm just trying to make it humanly understandable, like a pinball or whatever we're, we're going through. And sometimes it seems like that's just it. We're just reacting to, to life when, in fact, God knew that we were in him before the foundation of the world. I said it years ago. He had us hid in Christ. Yes. If the devil would have known when I was doing my thing, what might end up being the result of my life, I'm not trying to brag on myself, I'm just saying what a kind of a change God could make in my life. He would have snuck me and he had, believe me, he had plenty of opportunities. I could have OD'd multiple times. I could have been killed in Vietnam. I could have, had, I could have car wrecks and drunk driving. I mean, just any number of ways. God tried to cleave my head with an ax in Madison, Wisconsin one time. There were plenty of times I could have been killed. But God understood some other kind of a plan. And all of our lives are like this. You just may not have had the, the weird one that I've had. But let's face it, we all know we, there were times when things could have turned out totally different than they did. God has a plan. It's a cosmic plan. It's not one that we always understand or can identify with. It's just we look back and we go, wow, what happened? What in the world was God doing? And he was doing something in all of it. Praise the Lord for our light affliction. Okay. Uh, let's, go, let's go to Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. Be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying. We are the new Jerusalem, by the way, in case you're questioning this. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. We are, in God's eyes, literally his DNA on earth. We are the seed of God and so are our offspring. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I, see, we're going to go to verse 25. But I'm saying that we're, this is where we are right now. And this is what Don was talking about. And it's what the scripture is talking about when he says the the, the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Well, there have never been really righteous people until today. There's really only ever been one righteous man, and that was Jesus, until the New Testament church comes into, into play. Now we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? 
And so when he talks about, uh, you know, if you can't go back to verse 24, it shall come to pass before they call, I'll answer. God's doing stuff before we even have sense enough to ask him for it. He's working things out in our life before we know to try to get him to do it. Why? Because we are now one spirit. We're connected all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. Like I told my mother, he's always with you, Mom. He's never going to leave you. Whether you're feeling it or not, whether you feel totally alone, whether you to feel totally cut off, whether you feel like, yes, I can't hear anything what God's trying to say. Believe me, he hears the cry of your heart. He knows it before you can ever say it. Amen. And it will come to pass that before they call, I'll answer. And while they're yet speaking, before you finish your sentence, he's like my wife. He'll finish it for you. He knows, he knows what you're going to say. And knows it better, can say it better, praise the Lord. And the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. You can attach any metaphor to that you want. But what God is saying is, evil cannot come nigh you. I don't care how bestial it is. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care. Everybody's talking about these blood moons. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's fine. I'm not against it. I'm just saying we ought to be more focused on the blood of Christ and less focused on stars and stripes and whatever else might be out there. I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm just saying we can get so caught up in the latest preaching thing or latest effort to get people to come to God and be aware. But I'm telling you what, I'm not worrying about the rapture. It'll happen when it happens, and when it happens, I'm out of here. If it happens pre, mid, or post, I have my opinion, but I'm, it's not worth arguing about. I just, I just, I, I hear people all the time saying, "You better get ready. You better get ready." I'm saying, if I'm not ready, I'm never going to get ready. If, if, he, if his grace wasn't sufficient, whatever I can do between now and whenever the rapture takes place isn't going to be enough. Believe me. If you're not trusting in him to get you out of here, you're likely going to be here. Praise the Lord. So, as the ascended Lord, he is spreading the gospel. And he's building up his church by working in people like you. Come on, man. Not preachers on TV, you know, whatever the, the Christian network might be that you watch or, or the, that are just out there. But he's doing it through people like us, like you and me. Just regular people. Come on. Praise the Lord. He's doing it through a stepson praying for the life of his stepmother that he loves. Right. And maybe not getting the result that he thought he was there to get. But the Holy Spirit moves and something comes alive in a man who has denied this Come on. all of his life. I'm saying this is cosmic. It isn't human. It isn't what people can do. Because if people could do it, believe me, somebody in Jason's family would have got to his dad a long time ago. Yeah, right. they, would have, they would have made him believe something, somehow, some way. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So he's spreading the gospel and he's building up the church and he's doing it by people like us. And he's doing it while he guides the events of history toward this glorious end. If you think, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying stuff doesn't happen in the world that isn't the will of God. But if you think God is, doesn't have control over how this thing's going to end up, that's what he means by he'll take every evil, every bad thing, and make it work out for our good. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean there isn't bad things happening. There is tribulation in this world, but be of good cheer, I have overcome it. <laughs> so for us, he's still working it out to the end that he has declared is ours. A glorious, hallelujah, ending, praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 12 and 13, verses 12 and 13. Hallelujah, Jesus, praise God. For by one spirit, or for as the body is one, now get the, the language here. As the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free. 
and have all and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now let me just say this, and you can argue later if you want, but <laughs> when you got saved, you know, John the Baptist was baptizing people, and the scripture says, unto repentance. Now they had already been repented, or he wouldn't have baptized them. Right. You understand what I'm saying? He discerned, they had repented, they confessed, he baptized them. When you get baptized into Christ, you're already a believer, or your baptism doesn't make any difference. You understand what I'm saying? You're already one. You're already there. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you already have the Holy Spirit. You get baptized into the Holy Spirit, you receive the seal. Yes. Yes. Or you wouldn't be getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Amen. What I'm saying is, what he's telling us is, you're, you're one. If, whether you think you're one or don't think you're one, if you, if you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and rose the third day for your sins, then you are in Christ. You are One, you're not just in Christ and he's just in you. You are one. As far as eternity is concerned, you are one and the same. You say, well, I don't, I mean, it doesn't, I don't, how, how can that be? The same way he can hear every prayer at the same moment, any place, and answer each one of them individually. And how he can speak to all these different hearts. Because he's God, because it's, he doesn't do work like we work. He doesn't think like, when the moment we try to, Dumb him down into our theologies, we lose what's really going on here. How, if you were saved before the foundation of the world, believe me, you didn't just bop into this thing 20 years ago when you said, uh, I I confess Jesus as my personal Savior. Yeah, Yeah, there was a moment here in in natural time where you acknowledged what was already a fact. Or you wouldn't have acknowledged it. That's what you've got to understand. There are things God's doing in your life. He's going to do them one way or another. You and Him are one. You are not greater than God. You cannot stop God from doing what God has already planned and purposed for you. You can create all kinds of, you know, problems for yourself. By trying to figure all that out. But the best thing you can do. He said is rest in him. Quit you. And get into him. Realize he's doing some stuff here. I don't get it. I don't understand. He said well I did this. I did that. You know please. My my daughter. Who lives in, in, in New Jersey. I'm talking to her last night. And she's saying you know I can't wait to get back there. So we can all get together and pray for my son. Because she, he, she said, Dad, he's really messed up. I said, well, it, 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 it's in their genes. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry, we'll pray. I do pray for him. But I, I've got promises here. Come on. He cannot screw this up. Max is not bigger than God. That's right. Come on. He's just Max. He can only do what Max does, and that ain't enough. Right. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be consequences. There may be some suffering for Max. I don't want there to be. But he told us, whatever it is, it ain't going to amount to nothing compared to the glory that God has already designed and planned through this cosmic plan. We can make our lives filled with tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome it. I'm telling you, I'm saying this, that we ought to have hope. That we ought to have an expectation of good. Amen. That's God. That's what God is. And you cannot make him something else, even if you want him to be. How many of you, when you didn't know half of what you know today, God was still doing good stuff for you? Thank you, Lord. Your theology didn't change God. Nope. It just changed your perception. Yeah. Just changed what you expected. Yes. And after all, look where you are now. 
Look what you believe now. Come on. More, Lord. Hallelujah. So that's what the ascension is. But how does it affect us in our daily lives? And i got to rush now. Because it's too hot. John chapter 20, verse 17. Greatest compliment you can give God, Donnie. Hallelujah. Is just quit trying to make everything right yourself. It doesn't work anyway, I can promise you that. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Now, I, I know I always had believed this because of the way I was taught. But the reason he was saying that was because he hadn't gone back to heaven and been sanctified. So somehow she could defile him. But I mean, just a little bit of thinking through that, and you realize he told us himself, you can't defile the altar with a messed up sacrifice. That's right. The messed up sacrifice gets sanctified by the altar. So what, he was, what Jesus was, was really saying was this. He's saying, Mary... I can understand why you don't want to lose me, why you don't want me, your teacher and your friend, to go away, or somehow that you would lose me. But if you really understand what's going on, you'd realize that after I ascend, you're going to have me all the time, everywhere, anywhere. Come on. And you're going to know some things because of the Holy Spirit that you have not been able to figure out up to this point because you're still looking for a dead Jesus. Come on. So she's not saying, oh, don't touch me, you're going to defile me. He's, he's saying, don't, don't try to hold on to me here. Because the fact that I ascend is going to put me in a relationship with you unlike any we could have ever had on, on a natural level. Yeah. That's what he's trying to get everybody to understand. Yeah. Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 6. He's saying to her, just like I told my mother, you're going to have me all the time forever. I'm not really going away. I'm coming back in a more powerful, impacting way. In a greater type of relationship than we ever could have in the natural. And it hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen? Now, he's not talking about just Benny Hinn or Oral Roberts or pick any other evangelist or preacher that you've heard about or, you know, that's ever done anything. He's talking about not just special, spiritually endowed people. He's talking about every single believer. Every believer has been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where is he seated? At the position of all power. All power. Above every dominion. Over every authority. Over every bit. He's in God's position. He is God now. But he's a man. Oh, yes. Jesus, help us to understand this. He is telling us we have been given the same authority as God himself. That's why Jesus said it over and over. Whoever sin you, 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 you remit, I'll remit. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. We say, well, it's got to be bound in heaven first. Well, why would we be trying to bind something that isn't bound there? Come on. When we speak against cancer, we're just simply loosing the power of, that we have seated in that position of Christ. Right. Amen. Come on. And the problem is our finite minds and our religious ways of thinking says, Oh, God, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're saying we're God. I'm saying we are one. I'm saying he's what he said. That's right. God is now a man. Whoa, hallelujah. God is not just this vapor, this ether thing. God has become a man. 
And God has stayed a man. Hallelujah. He's still a man. But he's still God. And he's told us, you can have this same life. Listen, the scripture says that when it's all said and done, we will all be one in God. Yes. I and my Father, you and me, we in Him, one. Yes. Yes. Now that doesn't mean there's just going to be one big blob up there with a head that looks like Jesus. <laughs> it means that we are going to literally be like God. We're going to be God. Does not your own scripture tell you, ye are God's? He told that to the Jews when they were accusing him of blasphemy when he said, I am the Son of God. Right. When you see me, you've seen the Father. Right. Yeah. When you see Jesus, you've seen all of God you are ever going to see. Come on. Come on. Praise God. And it's more than just the idea that God is now a man, which is mind-blowing in itself, but it's that we can participate in that Godhead. The fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him. What did you get when you got born again? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The fullness of the Godhead. He didn't separate it. He didn't like fractionalize it so that he could get into us. Come on. Your spirit is huge. It's big enough to absorb or to hold the Godhead. Come on. This is what God did for us. This is what Jesus is trying to show us in the ascension. It's not just a, a pretty little picture that we look at. He's, there he goes. No, he's saying, wherever I'm going, you're going with me. When I come back, you're coming back with me. When I leave in the rapture, you're going with me. How can you not go with him? You've got to cut off an arm. You've got to cut off. I'm, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave part of me here. We are one body. It ought to give you a great expectation and lose the fear over the rapture. Lose the fear over blood moons and all of that. I'm not saying those are signs, but they're not for the believer. Come on. Amen. We've got the only sign we need. He said, Look at my hand. Look at the, yeah, that's right. the nail prints of my hands and my, and my feet. Look at the, the spear and where it went in my side. Yep. He said, This is an evil generation. That seeketh a sign. Mm -hmm. And he said. The only sign you're going to get. Is me. That's what he told them. Right. That would be very unfair of God. To do one thing for them. And something else for us. Right. You want a sign. It's Jesus. Come on. It's Christ and him crucified. Yes. It's God in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Remaining in the flesh. Yes. In a transformed body. Yes. A glorified body. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Romans 5 5. I'm sorry, but Hallelujah. I'm excited. Anyhow, <laughs> praise the Lord. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 8 34. The love of God is shed, not my love. It's not my love that's being shed abroad for other people. Because I can tell you the honest to God truth, like most of you could when you're honest with yourself, there aren't that many people that I love. Even in my own family. Some I don't even like. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, I'm not trying to be even worse than I actually am. but We do things because we know that it's the right thing to do a lot of times. It isn't motivated by our personal love because our love is very erratic. But God's love is perfect. So when we're operating the way we are cosmically designed to operate or spiritually designed to operate, it is the love of God that's being shed abroad. Amen. Just exactly what Jason was saying earlier. Amen. What they experience is not Jason's love because I, I can guarantee you, having talked to Jason, that there, he, he was having mixed feelings. He loved his stepmother, he loved his dad, but there were some people in that room that you really weren't feeling like it's, this is, you know, kumbaya. Uh, uh, you know, for some people that you just want to slap and say, come on, wake up or get out. Yeah. Right? And that's not a, that's, that doesn't mean you hate, it just means you're not feeling a love for them right at that moment. But God was. 
Because God isn't dealing with our senses. He doesn't have to deal with our feelings. He just loves them. So who is that? He that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Praise the Lord. Because he has ascended, we can know his presence actually. Come on. Really speaking to us. Actually really teaching us. Actually pouring his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Jesus passed into heaven. Out of space and time. So that he can come into anybody's life. In a living reality. Praise the Lord. When God looks at you, yeah, if you're taking notes, write this down. When God looks at you, he sees himself. Amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. Yeah. The ascended Jesus. When God hears you, he hears him. Amen. Amen. It's like an echo. Father, raise her up, heal her, deliver her. God, show me the next step. Yes, yes. And God's hearing Himself. I'll direct your path. Come on. By my stripes, you're healed. Amen. Jesus, Jesus. He doesn't hear our pathetic, half-hearted, confused. He hears him. Yeah. He sees him. Yeah. Let's, let's quit with this. Acts chapter 7, verse 56. Acts 7, 56. This is Stephen. And he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Mm-hmm. Now, anybody with a lick of sense knows Jesus wasn't standing on God's palm. <laughs> he was standing in the position. Stephen understood this. Stephen said, oh, my God, he is God. Hallelujah. When he said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. All of a sudden, pow, revelation. I see him. He's there with all the power of God himself. Hallelujah. And you know what it did to Stephen? He understood it, especially in that moment, because it was the last moment of his life. He was about to be stoned to death. Right. The one who died for him was God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's ascended. And now he's representing me before the judgment seat of the universe. Amen. And he's saying, not guilty. Even though everybody on earth is saying, blasphemer, liar, throw another stone. Paul, who's gonna, or Saul, who's eventually going to be Paul, is standing there holding the coats of these guys so they get got a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Pow. Yep. And he's at peace. And it says, the scripture talks about him just like he almost was a glow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With that anointing like, like Moses had. Like Jesus had. Mm -hmm. The presence of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. He didn't care what anybody else said. That's right. The verdict of the earth didn't matter a bit. Because he knew how he was judged in heaven. <clears throat> he knew how God judged him. Amen. That verdict it is the only verdict. Jesus Christ went to the right hand of the throne to be our prophet, our king, our priest, and our God. He's our leader, our intercessor, our intimate friend, our brother on a cosmic scale. Amen. I'm not just God's son. I'm his brother. Now that tells you there can be different personalities in brothers, but the DNA is going to be the same. The makeup is the same. Yeah. They come from the same source. 
That's the doctrine of the ascension. And it's about time that the church rose up yep. into the position that God has given us. And it starts getting bold. Not allowing the experience to dictate our identity yes. or our reality or the cosmic plan of God. We just do what we do and believe that God's involved in it. He has to be, and we wouldn't be involved in it. That's the bottom line. You think, think, I don't care how big a scale it is that you're operating on or how minute and uh, just mundane and routine. There is nothing mundane and routine about this plan that God has. We have a tendency to think of, well, we're on a large, when we're on a large platform, when we're before a lot of people, when we're doing certain... Look, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Every single life is precious to God. Amen. He gave himself for it. Every interaction that we have is a part of... You think, you think well, yeah, I mean, I understand God's got the big picture in mind here, so every year there's probably something big that goes on. No. There isn't a minute of your day that God isn't in charge of somehow. Amen. It has to be, because even the bad things that happen, he works them out for good. He doesn't, he's not playing catch up. It's not like, uh oh, screwed up over there. Hurry up, get over there and fix that. He's seen it all. That's what I mean by him directing history to this glorious end. Only God knows at this point what glory is going to be revealed in us at that point. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. So we can be positive in any situation, any circumstance. We just remain positive. We just say, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, but God's got a plan to make this work. That's right. Somehow, some way, it has to be the right way. It has to be exactly what God wants to do here. Because God is greater than everything. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he looks like us. <laughs> Amen. Heaven's not going to be freaky. It's going to be just like a really great world. It's going to be like this, the way it was supposed to be. Hallelujah. Amen. Because this earth is going to be transformed just like the new heaven. It's going to be just like. Amen. Heaven. It's just going to be terrestrial. Amen. And. Because of our glorified bodies, we just zip back and forth like you see a comet shooting across the sky. We're here, and we think, oh, I left the burner on in the mansion. <laughs> I'm right back there. Right? Oh. Hallelujah. The microwave's on. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's go down and have some good lunch. Let me pray before we go, and we won't have to do it downstairs. Father, we thank you for the food today, for the hands that prepared it. Thank you for your people. We ask you to bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Give us an opportunity to, to draw closer to one another and by doing so, draw closer to you. Bless everybody that's able to stay and those that aren't able to be here. Bless them as well, Lord. And we'll look forward to your blessings throughout the ends of our lives and throughout eternity as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.